السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. الحمد لله by the grace of Allah سبحانه وتعالى we have the honor the presence of our brother our sheikh our elder Abu Amina Bilal Phillips he's come all the way to sacrifice his time for one reason to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be among us this is his family Alhamdulillah he was here some 11 years back and he has managed to find some time for us today inshallah he will be talking to you we request you to give him all the attention and we'll have some time for questions I will request the questions to be written and passed over to us from the door inshallah this is a hadith of the Prophet Rasulullah that says, if I'm not wrong, my shaykhs will correct me, that we have to choose a friend from a status of his religious belief and practice. We have to look at the aqidah and the deen of the person. And I think Surah Qul Ya al talks about us Muslim sisters and brothers to be in company of people of our kind to be together with people who have in them good deen and aqidah so alhamdulillah I have the honor personally to say I'm proud to have Sheikh Abu Abina Bilal Phillips my brother my friend and our mentor, the Father Shah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, was salat was salam, wa ala was sulim kareem, wa ala ali was habi, wa man is tenna bi sulnatihi in ayamadim. All praise due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessing be on the last Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. <clears throat> this evening's or this afternoon's topic, Muslim women in contemporary society, addresses the current situation that Muslim women should be uh, engaged in. However, we must understand that Islam covers all places, all times, all circumstances. So the principles which were set by the Quran and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad and the understanding which the early generation of Sahaba and the Tabi'een, Tabi'u Tabi'een, those early generations, their understanding of how a woman was to function in society, that represents our basic guidelines. This is the foundation that we build from. We don't have modern versions of Islam and ancient versions of Islam. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala laid down the laws for Muslim society, identifying the roles of each and every member, He did so knowing the nature of human beings, how their societies would develop how people would interact with each other, along with the technological developments that would take place, he laid those laws down knowing all of that. So when we look at the 
issue of Muslim women in contemporary society today, we have to look at it really from the perspective of Muslim women in this time of Prophet Muhammad How were they? Were they barred from the masjids? As in some Muslim countries, Muslim women cannot enter masjids. Like Pakistan and India, many of the masjids have no place for women. And women who try to enter such masjids would be physically prevented. However, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had clearly instructed his generation, La tamna'u ima'akum al masajid. Don't prevent your female uh, members from the mosques. He did say that their, their homes were better for them, but the basic principle is that they were not to be prevented. And we know from the practice of the women in the time of the Prophet وسلم, his wives and the wives of the Sahaba, etc., that they used to regularly go to the masjid for Salat al-Fajr, Maghrib and Isha. The other prayers which are in the middle of the day, uh, with, when uh, their home needs that needed to be fulfilled, etc., then they focused in the homes. But in the early morning, they used to go out for the prayer when it was darker, also when you know the chances of being observed, etc., was much less. So the early morning prayer and the night prayers they commonly attended. <clears throat> that is just to say that we may find attitudes, cultural practices, etc. today, which are in fact foreign to the Islamic body of knowledge, to Islamic teachings. And we have to be able to distinguish between what is acceptable Islamically, based on Islamic teachings, and what is not. So that addresses Primarily education, that Muslim women should be educated. When Prophet Muhammad had said, Talabul Ilmi Farida ala kulli Muslim, seeking knowledge is compulsory for every Muslim, it meant literally for every Muslim, whether male or female. Now, the education of Muslim females begins, of course, in the home, where they should be raised conscious of who they are, conscious of Allah. They should be taught Salah at the age of seven and be spanked for it if they don't establish the prayer by the age of ten. The hijab should be introduced early, because when we teach them salah, it means teaching them how to cover themselves properly, because salah, uh, with where the outer is exposed, is not acceptable. So the issue of uh, basic requirements for females in terms of education in the home uh, clearly identifies a responsibility on parents to educate both their female and male members. Unfortunately, in some cultures, education tends to be focused on the males, and the females get uh, whatever they get by default or whatever trickles down to them. However, from the Islamic perspective, they should be as educated as the males. And when we look at the role which Aisha anha Um Salama and other wives of the Prophet وسلم, had in teaching Islam to the generation to come, we have to say that women played a major role in the education of the Ummah 
in the conveyance of Islam to us today. In fact, Aisha Anha was the fourth most prolific narrator of hadith among any of the companions of the Prophet One, actually there's a book which was written by one of his scholars concerning the mistakes which Aisha uh, corrected, which were prevalent or which were being done by male Sahaba. So she was, without a doubt, one of the leading legal scholars of Islam and that first generation. So, as we said, education uh, begins at home. Uh, female children need to be aware of their role. I would say that in terms of dress, which tends to be one of the big issues concerning uh, females because of the issue of hijab and their hijab being so complete, so you know, all-encompassing, that it is advisable that children not be raised wearing typical European, American, Western clothes where these clothes tend to be very tight, exposing what would be aura in the future, where the children get used to that kind of dress, it becomes then very difficult later on to wean them out of it and give them proper dress. So my advice is, from the earliest age, do not get them in that habit. I know people say, but they're only children. What does it matter if this is exposed or this is tight, etc.? You know, this is not really our. Yes, it's true. But the child who gets accustomed to this type of dress will give you all kinds of resistance and difficulty later on. So a special care has to be taken to address those issues which are special and unique to females to ensure that uh, the children, female children, are raised uh, properly, raised in a way which would facilitate their proper implementation of Islam in their later years. Furthermore, the issue of education, where we now put our females into educational institutions, I have to stress here that it is critical that Muslim children be educated in Islamic institutions. Of course, those that are here, those that are here already uh, know this. You are in this institution and your families have sent you for this purpose. So, uh, I'm not trying to convince you, but for those of you that are visiting this institution because of the lecture, etc., I would advise you very strongly to reconsider your decision to put your children, especially your female children, and really there's no difference between female or male, but I'm, since we're focused on the female side of things, putting your female children in government schools or private schools, which means in term, in fact, Christian schools. This is a major error which has become prevalent in many parts of the Ummah and people have turned a blind eye to the damage that is taking place. We have to seriously consider these choices. We as parents, as Prophet Muhammad had said, Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'oolun an ra'iyati. Each and every one of you is a shepherd responsible for his or her flock. And we will be asked how we raised our children, how 
were they educated. It is the right, a primary right, of every Muslim child to be educated Islamically, educated in an Islamic institution, educated by Muslims. This is their primary right. If we do not fulfill this right, and they go astray, which is the greatest likelihood, then we carry the burden of their sins. They will still be accountable, because still people have to make choices, and everybody is accountable before law. But we, having put them in that situation, will carry a great burden of sin, and have serious questions to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. So I advise you very strongly to reconsider your decision. The arguments which people use concerning academics, where they will say, for example, that the academics in the Muslim institutions is low. Their standard of academics is not competitive. It is lower than that of the private institutions or the government institutions. We have to consider what do we really want for our children? What is the future that we want for them? If we only have a choice between Islamic institutions with poor academics, where our child will come out conscious of his or her Islam, but weak in mathematics, in science, whatever. Or we have a choice of putting them in the other types of institutions where they will come out weak in Islam. Maybe their Islam is so confused they will leave Islam. But they will be excellent in their academics. They will have top marks and they will be able to get into top institutions. We have to ask ourselves, if we only have a choice between these two, which one is pleasing to Allah? I'm sure you will all agree with me that to put our child in an Islamic institution with weak academics is preferable, is obligatory, is a requirement of us as long as such an institution is available over putting that child in a public or government institution, private institution, where their Islam will be challenged from the time they set foot in that institution till the time they leave. So let us not be deluded by the issues of academics. Academics we can make up. The child comes through somewhat weak in academics, we can get tutors, we can arrange others who can help them. Maybe they'll use, lose a year to prepare themselves properly for university. Okay, but their Islam is intact. They know who they are. They know who Allah is. That is a Muslim. The other, who has come through confused, messed up, who is going to go on into college, what do you think you can do for them? You think you can now go and teach them Islam at that point? They're not interested. Islam is, you know, for all people. It's not relevant to the modern world. So, you've lost a soul. You've lost your child. So let us not be deluded about this. Of course, the goals that Islamic education institutions should have should not be purely uh, high uh, Islamic standards and low and accept the idea of low educational standards. This should not be acceptable in any form or state of this uh, of our affairs. We have an obligation to, as educationalists, to provide the best and highest standard of academics that we can. Our institutions should be known in the country. We should, re we should achieve the top marks. It shouldn't be the Hindu 
uh, institution is known for producing the top IGCSC results. No, it should be a Muslim institution known for that. Because we have, based on our system, a, a system which would provide the maximum support for the student, both Islamically as well as academically. They will not have the kind of distractions that uh, the other institutions will have. Boyfriend, girlfriend, dating, music, all the other things which you know, occupy people's minds and their hearts, etc., confuse them. They will be free from that. So they will, be, they will have more time to apply their energies you know, positively in educating themselves academically. So we should produce the top academics in the country. That's the type of institution which of course we feel is pleasing to Allah where it is coupled with high Islamic moral standards. So we, we should have both. That's what we should be aiming for. However, the reality is that if we don't have both, then we have to, and we don't have to accept with only one of the two, then we have to settle with the one which is going to guarantee for our children, inshallah, a knowledge of Allah, fear of Allah, knowledge of Islam, practice of Islam. That is the one which must take precedence. Having said that, if we look at higher education, our children graduating from institutions, hopefully Islamic institutions, we should be careful about how we direct them into institutions of higher learning, especially considering that these institutions are not under our control. If we see that our daughters, for example, in spite of the best opportunities we have given them to be Islamically educated, their Islam is still a bit weak. They are weak personalities. Then we should not, under any circumstance, put them in these non-Muslim institutions of higher learning. We should not. This is a big mistake to do so. The children who we put, or the girls who we put in the higher institutions, are those whose Islam are attacked. We can see they have a firmness, they're clear about who they are, they're clear about Islam. In fact, they're even giving da'wah to their contemporaries, others, their classmates, etc. These are the people who you may select from them, those who will now go on to higher learning, and then we need to choose our profession as well. We need to look at the need of the Muslim community because our graduates from university should come back and serve the Muslim community. It is the Muslim community that has pooled its resources to produce them. So, having graduated, they should understand that they have a responsibility to bring their skills, their knowledge, their expertise back to benefit the community. As Prophet Muhammad had taught, Khair al-Nas and Fa'ahum nas The best of people are those most beneficial to people. So this issue of benefit becomes a critical issue when we talk about education. So our female students should choose fields which are the critical fields needed for the community. One of the major fields is education. This is one of the major fields that we have proper, properly trained uh, Muslim female teachers to come back and teach in these institutions. And my advice is that if we put a female in to gain uh, the knowledge uh, in focusing on the field of education, we should try to encourage them to go all the way to PhD. Not just to do a BA, many that's all they will be able to do. But those that are able to go ahead and do a master's in education, PhD in education, we should encourage them to do so. Why? Because we have to set up alternative institutions. How can we set up 
Islamic universities where we are going to teach uh, education from an alternative perspective, from an Islamic perspective, if we don't have people who are trained. So we must be thinking ahead, thinking of the future, thinking of, uh, of development of community and plan for that, planning ahead. <clears throat> this is very, very important, not just look at the present. So on one hand, yes, we need teachers right now in the present, so some of them will go through and come and be utilized immediately, but then others should be encouraged to go through and become highly trained uh, educationists who can lead the institutions that we hope to uh, develop to serve the needs of the Muslim community. So this is one area, education. Then there are other areas, uh, and I, I don't need to necessarily go and list each and every area that is available, because there are many. But there are some critical areas. Number one on my critical list after education is medicine, gynecology. That we should have female gynecologists. As I tell the males, the male groups that I uh, speak to, youths who are looking into education and choosing their fields, etc., I instruct them you know, to be careful about the fields that they choose. And among the fields that I told them are impermissible for them is to specialize in gynecology. For a Muslim male to specialize in that field, we say it is not acceptable Islamically. Of course, to be a doctor means you must have some training in it. So if a need arises, emergency, etc., you do what you have to do. But to say that is going to be my profession, I am going to be the top female gynecologist in the world, no. But for females, yes, we encourage the women to master in this field, become the top, top of the line female gynecologist, yes. This is an area which will protect the Muslim community. So husbands, fathers, brothers don't have to send their daughters, sisters, and <clears throat> wives to male gynecologists on the basis of Dorura. We can't find a female gynecologist, so and so, so we have to send them, so we're sending them. No. This is something which is abhorrent. Islamically, it is something clearly displeasing to Allah. Only under emergency circumstances, where one has no other choices, this is where one may make that decision. Otherwise, we should be working towards developing alternatives. Similarly, in dentistry, we need to have female dentists, because this is a profession which requires very close contact. So the idea that a female would go into a dentist's office, stretch herself out on this dentist's chair, and have the dentist stick his nose in her mouth, we say Islamically <laughs> this is not acceptable. A male dentist is not acceptable. You know? So she is put in a very vulnerable circumstance, a very wrong situation, Many times she gets abused without even realizing it. We say this is not acceptable. So therefore, we do need female dentists. As we need male dentists, we need female dentists. So that we can develop you know, dental surgeries where we have the option of male and female for those patients that are coming in. You know, this is among the major necessities. So some of our daughters need to be directed, channeled into these areas. And among the areas, for example, which I would not advise women to be involved in, there are some which may be very specific, but in general, for example, a civil engineering. Now, the society does need civil engineers, but this is mainly a male field. It's dominated by men. If a woman becomes a civil engineer, she is going to be surrounded by men. She's going to be dealing with men top to bottom. She will not, she'll be harassed. She will be harassed. Uh, she will not be able to function effectively in those circumstances. We know uh, harassment is a norm in Western circumstances where people are free and they can mix with each other how they want, etc., etc. Yet, women, whatever the profession they go into, if it is a male dominated profession, then they get harassed. Many books have been written on the harassment of the job in the West. Even if they go into the army, the navy, the air force, wherever they go, they get harassed. So this is not an appropriate field 
for a woman to go and specialize in. If she likes elements of engineering, etc., she may study it to be a teacher in uh, school, back down to high school and junior high, etc., where she uses her knowledge in teaching uh, children and youth. Now, that covers issues of education, education opportunities, choices in education, etc. If we go forward to uh, Islamic education, which, of course, as we said in the very beginning, was the most important element of our education, it is important that, as a Muslim woman, she be thoroughly educated Islamically in order to raise her children Muslims. Because education begins in the home. She is the one who controls the home, the home environment. She is the one who ensures that the child is in an Islamic environment in the home and the child is exposed continually to the teachings of Islam. The upbringing of the children uh, will depend to a large degree to, on the mother. Because the father is away most of the time, the rest of the time the child is spending in school, then the rest of the major part of the time belongs to the mother. So women, mothers, have to be well versed in the various areas of Islamic knowledge in order to impart that to their children as they grow up in the homes. I would also add to this that for raising children, many parents have no idea of how to raise children. In fact, I would say most don't. It's a trial and error circumstance. You do certain things to your first child, later on you realize that wasn't the best thing, so you don't do that to the next child. So as Time gets on, you hear the older children say, Oh, mom, you used to beat us for that. Now you're letting so and so get away with it. You know? Because you're experimenting. You're trying things out to see what would work, what wouldn't work, etc. And you realize maybe I was being too tough, so then you ease off or whatever. But really, we should have parenting classes. Parenting classes where, you know, women and men are taught how to raise children properly what things to avoid, what things to do, how to control behavior without having to resort to violence, you know, and screaming and shouting and breaking things, you know, how to raise children in a healthy Islamic environment. Most of us need training. We need those who will guide us and advise us in this matter. So this is where I would advise um, institutions like this institution that they do bring in uh, child psychologists, Muslim child psychologists who have the knowledge of uh, children and how they learn etc. to add and expand the scope of education for this institution. Now regarding uh, Muslim women who are in the working field, where do we draw the line? Of course, fundamentally, Muslim women should be working in female-friendly environments. They shouldn't be ending up in offices by themselves, behind closed doors, with males, which often happens in these working environments. They should be in a majority female environment and one which is free from what we call khalwa, where they are isolated in circumstances with males who they could mar marry or not from their maharim. <clears throat> Furthermore, those that are working need to stop for a minute and ask themselves whether the field that they're working in is really a productive field and beneficial to the community. And if it is not, 
then they should seriously consider changing. Even though it is comfortable, um, you know, the money is coming in, etc. But if it's really not appropriate, and you know it is not, then you should give it up and find a field which is more appropriate for you as a woman. Those represent the basic issues that I wanted to share with you this afternoon because this session really is dedicated to the issues that you are facing. And you here in Nairobi, in Kenya, have, I'm sure, many issues which are particular to yourselves, unique to yourselves, perhaps many issues that I've never even come across before. So I want to give uh, you ample opportunity to raise your questions and uh, I will try to help you find the answers for them. So I'm going to stop here and uh, hopefully you can start sending your questions forward and we can start to try to answer them.
basic courses from Islamic uh, knowledge, Aqidah, Fiqh, Tafsir, Hadith, uh, Sirah, Arabic, etc. Question, what is your opinion of a woman studying actual Science. Actual science. I'm not sure what you mean. Actuarial science. Actuarial science. Yeah, it involves uh, uh, data and projections. For example, media. Uh, um, not media. Uh, the economy, uh, how it's going, and insurance. And insurance and, and uh, insurance. Yeah, but actually, you don't have to work in the insurance. It's uh, projections based on, let's say, the company, based on past experience, they're going to make uh, profit or mm. lose on how much in this with mathematics and statistics. Okay, um, uh, if we're saying this is... Uh, in terms of uh, the field which deals with assessment really I guess assessment of businesses mm, and, and uh, projecting uh, future uh, directions of companies and likelihood of their success or failure etc this is uh, acceptable if uh, they are doing so and plan to work for example in a female business you know because it is possible for females to set up businesses and they would prefer to have a female working with them who is providing this information. So this is a field which, uh, though the opportunities for them may be limited, uh, it isn't uh, one which we would say no. But uh, I would say that if the chances of finding a female-friendly environment in which to practice is a small, then it's better to avoid it. If you know definitely, for example, your family or friends or connections have a business and they say we do need a female, can you focus on this and come through and you can work for us, then fine, go ahead. Maybe uh, in terms of uh, maybe El oh, yeah. oh, Okay, if it's an Akida issue yeah. uh, where uh, we are to look at the, the concept of projecting ideas into the future, you know, where you are now uh, estimating probabilities, you are predicting. As long as you say, inshallah, then it's fine. You're talking about how things are and how they appear to be going, and you make a prediction that this is likely the case, inshallah, this is fine. This doesn't enter into uh, challenging Allah's knowledge of the unseen. Okay, a question. Is female circumcision allowed in Islam? Uh, yes, it is. With restrictions. So that it doesn't involve actually uh, removal of parts from the body, but it's something similar to what happens with men. Male circumcision doesn't you know, remove body parts but only removes a small amounts of skin. So this is something permissible, not something required on the part of females, though it is required on the part of males. And that is, of course, males who uh, are in, at the age of uh, seven days, eight days. Uh, those uh, who end up growing, being grown individuals, for example, a man who accepts Islam is in his 20s, his 30s, or his 40s. For us to go and say that circumcision is uh, obligatory for him, this is not, in fact, correct. It is optional. Is there ever a certain situation which necessitates a husband using his fists to beat his wife? Should a wife continue living with such a husband? Well, if the wife is using her fist to beat him up. <laughs> we could say it's okay for him to use his to defend himself. But if it's only a one-way situation where he is just 
you know, whenever he feels like it or unjustified, etc., he is beating her with his fists. Then, of course, the woman uh, has the right to get her marriage annulled. She doesn't have to remain in such a situation. Uh, in fact, it is probably better for her to get out of it. Assalamu alaikum. I would like to do law and be a lawyer. But wanted to know if it is permissible. Well, in the case of law, I think this again is a man's world. It tends to be dominated by males and uh, especially criminal law and these other forms which involve Cape, uh, court appearances. And these. What age is it appropriate for a girl to start dating? <laughs> No age. <laughs> How are we supposed to find husbands if we do not date? Is it haram to have a boyfriend? How we are supposed to find husbands is uh, in the Islamic circumstance we have uh, family members, members of the community, who will help us to find suitable husbands. Uh, Islam protects the honor of the woman by not putting her in a circumstance where she has to go out and try to find a husband herself. So there are channels through family, or if we don't have family, through community leaders, etc., where that job is taken care of. So uh, we don't have to resort to dating, and what dating leads to, which involves you know, khalwa, and ultimately exposes uh, women to circumstances uh, which are clearly displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, especially when the practice of dating, as practiced in the West, becomes really a practice of trying goods before you buy them. You know? And, uh, this is something uh, abhorrent Islamically. Uh, we have uh, a special place in Islam for marriage and family, and it can only be protected if we avoid uh, such uh, customs, which are in fact harmful to the society as a whole. We also have the family resource center at the Jamia Mosque, wherein uh, females who would like to find husbands and males who would like to find wives, you know, can go in and uh, be interviewed, get their data uh, put into the system, and uh, we can, we have people there, uh, counselors, etc., helping you to find suitable husbands and wives based on religion and uh, education and the other qualities which are important. Inshallah, uh, many successful marriages have taken place through this instrument. So uh, I would advise you to take this route as opposed to dating. Can you come out of a career in an office and if you have no other source of income, at the same time you strictly follow the Islamic values and principles. How can you come out of a career? Well, one of two things. One, if your career is your absolute only means of survival in the society, and there is no body or individuals or institution prepared to help you, so you remain in that uh, career while trying to find alternatives, then we can say, okay, you're justified. But as long as there exists institutions, families, individuals, who, if you made the choice, they would help you to uh, find another opportunity for work, etc., then one should immediately take that opportunity. 
to do so because as the Prophet had said, Man taraka shay'an lillah awwadallahu khayran minin. Whoever gives up anything for the sake of Allah, Allah will replace it with something better. Do you intend to start undergraduate and postgraduate courses in medicine in your university? Yes, we do, but that will probably be some time down the line. Uh, that it requires a level of development that we, having started just you know a week ago, uh, don't see in the immediate future. But we do have plans to offer everything. We want it to be a complete university offering all the fields of learning that people uh, desire. I hear that you give Islamic courses through the internet. Uh, can we get a university degree in this way? Well, uh, let me say first, there are free courses uh, on my Islamic online university dot com website that is Islamic Online University dot com there you can take free courses about 14 free courses available in different areas of Islamic knowledge it is uh, systematically organized for you to follow a a um, we could say structured uh, process of learning so that is generally open. It has Dawah courses as well as courses in basic Islamic studies, Aqidah, etc., etc. There is also online uh, the Knowledge International University uh, from Riyadh, uh, the department, the English side of it, I am the uh, head of, and there is a BA degree offered there that you can get online from Knowledge International University from Riyadh. The Chancellor of Knowledge International University is Sheikh Asudais, the Imam of Mecca. Uh, also, uh, in the coming year, inshallah, we do hope to offer another BA online from uh, the Islamic Online University, which will be uh, affiliated with Omdurman Islamic University, where the degrees will be issued from Omdurman Islamic University, uh, as well as uh, a university in India. We hope to offer it from there too. So these should be coming up soon also. For Knowledge International University, you type in kiu.org and that should take you to Knowledge International University. How relevant is it for a Muslim woman to propose to a Muslim man if she feels he is of the right character. It was the Sunnah of Khadija anha. And there were also other Muslim women who came to the Prophet and proposed marriage to him at different points in his lifetime. So we know that it is from the Sunnah approved by Prophet Muhammad. In fact, he got married in that way. Assalamu alaikum. I heard it is not a must for me to cook and wash or generally work in my house as a wife. I mean that it's not compulsory upon me. But if I do it, I will get rewarded. Is that true? Well, to be honest, there are scholars who hold this position. It is taught from a legal perspective. However, Prophet Muhammad has said that the right of the woman is that she be looked after. She be clothed from the clothing that her husband buys, fed from the food that he eats, you know, and accommodated in his housing. This is her right. And also that she not be hit in her face among the things that if any uh, hitting takes place, it should not be in her face. Besides that, on the other hand, 
Prophet had said that the right of the husband is that he be obeyed. So if he says, wash my clothes, and you say, I don't have to wash your clothes, then he's not being obeyed. So though we have legal arguments that a woman is not obliged, we do have general principles in marriage which oblige the woman to obey her husband as long as he doesn't command her to do anything which is haram. So, uh, I would say that the obligation of the wife is to look after her home, as Prophet had said, not allow anyone in her home who is displeasing to her husband, and to do the household chores, duties, uh, and generally present, make, put, uh, you could say, prepare herself in a presentable way when her husband comes home, uh, a way which is pleasing, as Prophet Sallallahu had said, you know, the best of women are the one who, when her husband looks at her, he's pleased. So she presents herself in a pleasing fashion. You know, and this is good for uh, the overall feelings uh, between mutual attraction, love, etc., between husband and wife. What is the cure for depression? Well, the cure for depression is ultimately having a strong bond with Allah. Knowing that whatever happens in one's life is by Allah's permission and that there is good in it even if we can't see it. And knowing that every difficulty is followed by ease. All of this comes from knowing a law. The best cure for depression is knowledge of the law. And we gain that through reading the Quran. And this is why Allah refers to the Quran saying, Fi shifa'un linnas, or shifa'un fi lima fi sudur, you know, describing the Qur'an as being a cure for the ailments of the soul, of the heart. This is and the major ailment is that of depression after kufr. Question, is it permissible to settle in a non-Muslim country? Technically speaking, it isn't. Prophet absorbed himself, saying, مِمَّنْ مَاتَ بَيْنَ ضَحْنَيْ الْكُفَارِ or مِمَّنْ عَاشَ بَيْنَ ضَحْنَيْ الْكُفَارِ that the Prophet had said that I absolve myself from anyone who lives or in some cases anyone who dies in the midst of the disbelievers that a Muslim should live in a Muslim community this doesn't necessarily mean a Muslim country because for example, Muslims are living here in Kenya. Uh, it is not a Muslim country, meaning it's not dominated by Muslims. The majority of citizens are not Muslims. So, I'm not proposing that Muslims should pack up their bags and all leave Kenya. This is not realistic at all. But what I'm saying is that, as Prophet said, Muslims should have areas, communities, where they are concentrated. They shouldn't be scattered amongst the, the non-Muslims so that whenever anything happens, any issue develops, they get harmed. They become targets. And this is what has happened in all the places where Muslims you know, have lived isolated, uh, mixed amongst the non-Muslims. When uh, issues develop in the society, they're the first ones to suffer, like in Gujarat and places like this. Uh, and uh, that, that's why Prophet said Muslims should live together. You should, your neighbors, those who are living across the road from you, beside you, behind you, etc., they should be Muslims.
It doesn't mean that non-Muslims can't come in your community. It's not, it's not a closed community, it becomes like a ghetto. No, but that yeah, Muslims should be in close proximity to each other. So even a masjid, for example, or a Muslim school like this, all the houses around it should be Muslim houses. That's the way it really should be. Because what happens is that when the school or the masjid is sitting by itself in a non-Muslim community, again, it's the first thing that gets burned down. Whenever any riots or anything happens, properties are lost, burned down, etc. And this only can be put, we can only protect ourselves if we live in Muslim communities. And I don't want to say Muslim, that's why I'm also shy away from Muslim country, because we have to say that when Prophet Muhammad uh, moved to Medina and established a community there, Muslims were still in a non-Muslim country. Arabia was a non-Muslim country. So, but what they did was when Prophet ﷺ had the means, went to Medina, the opportunity was there, then they created a Muslim community, which Muslims could live among. I plan on going to the UK next year for university, inshallah. What are the consequences of me not traveling with a mahram? Well, traveling with a mahram uh, is an obligation. One should really travel with a mahram. Of course, living there doesn't require a mahram, because a mahram is required for traveling, not for residence. Huh? So at least the mahram should carry you there and bring you back. That is a basic requirement. But I would say if you're going to the UK to study in university, you should think two times, three times, many times before going. And I would advise your parents to be very uh, careful about this decision to make sure that you're not going to go there and end up uh, destroying what faith you have. I don't advise people to migrate and go to the West to study unless they are people of very strong faith, very firm in their religion, they know their religion, they're practicing it well, and they're going to get knowledge there which is not available here. As long as that knowledge is available here, then it is better for them to get it here rather than going abroad. Next question. I, I am a cabin, I do the, I'm an air hostess. I'm an air hostess. Are we allowed to wear a hijab? Are we not, uh, and we are not allowed to wear a hijab. The only clothes that I use are either trousers or mini skirts. What can I do in such a statement? situation. That's my career. You need to get out of that career <laughs> without any uncertain terms. This is not appropriate for you as a Muslim woman. You need to get out of that career as quickly as possible. And know that if you get out and you are seeking Allah's pleasure in getting out to go into a profession or to seek Allah's bounty elsewhere, as Allah said in the Quran, that whoever fears Allah, Allah will find a way out for them. So know that He is Al Razak. He is the provider. He will provide for you. So my advice is to leave that profession as quickly as possible. Assalamu alaikum. The Majlis newspaper said this hadith of Prophet in which Prophet cursed women on saddles. There are people who say that one evidence of the Day of Judgment is that a lot, or the coming of the Day of Judgment, is that a lot of women will be driving vehicles. This is true. I never heard of that one either. <laughs> <laughs> what is the justification of a wife being hit slightly and not on the face by her husband? Well, Please know that it doesn't mean if you spill the tea, he's hitting you. You iron his clothes wrong, he's hitting you. No, this hitting is in the context of saving the marriage. This is the last resort left. You're ending up in divorce. He, you are, you are, you know, recalcitrant. 
you know, you're not listening, you're refusing to, to listen. So he hits you from the perspective of like taking a hold of you, in, 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 in taking a hold of your hand or your arm or whatever, there is an element of hitting because he's striking you in that sense. But he's striking you to take a hold of you to try to shake some sense into you or to, you know, just, uh, it's, uh, just to call attention, stop for a minute, Listen to what you're saying. Some, this is the kind of circumstances we're talking about. We're not talking about him taking out a belt or putting on boxing gloves, you know. <laughs> this is not, you know, it's unfortunate that some people think, the husband thinks, okay, if she wants a divorce, I'm just going to give her two black eyes before she goes. <laughs> this, is, this is definitely not from Islam at all. So it is only in the context of divorce where it is mentioned in the Quran. I work in a place with majority Christians. What can I do to stop shaking hands with the male of them? Keep your hands in your pockets. <laughs> Please give us the correct qualities of hijab. Uh, woman's hijab. Okay, we have a few questions on women's hijab. I'm sure this question must have been asked a thousand times. Uh, but just to quickly say, it should be loose, um, not colors which draw attention to yourself. Uh, it should be not see-through. Um, it should cover everything except for face and hands, according to the majority opinion, or including face, according to the minority. Um, those are the main uh, guidelines. And it should not be a dress which is well known amongst the certain elements or segments of the disbelievers or imitate uh, you know, a style which is a religious style of other religions. For example, like the habit, the nun's habit. Although it looks like hijab, it has its own specifications. So for a Muslim woman to wear a hijab which looks just like the habit where people might think that she's a Catholic nun, then it's not permissible. Okay, uh, my time is up now. We still have many other questions, but inshallah, uh, hopefully we'll get them answered at some point down the line. I'm sure you'll have many other uh, lectures coming, and we hope that inshallah you will uh, benefit from this session this evening and try to attend as many such sessions as possible in the future uh, to increase your knowledge, to be able to practice Islam in a better way and also that you are able to function within this society today in a way which is pleasing to Allah because this is really what our goal for seeking knowledge is, to be able to live lives which are in fact pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.